Hey guys and welcome back to my channel for another midweek mystery video. This week's video is probably one of my most highly requested videos ever and it's one that I've actually avoided doing for quite a long time because I find that whenever I do the more popular cases, the ones that are more well known, it kind of attracts the kind of viewers who like to be mean, shall we say. Um, but last week I was googling Ben's case, just a bit curious to see if there had been any updates. And it turns out that on the day I googled it, a load of new information about it had been released. And I thought that was a bit of fate, and I thought it was too much of a sign not to cover it. So this week I'm talking about the case of Ben Needham. If you're from the UK, then you've probably heard of this case, because Ben's family have done everything they can over the last almost 30 years to ensure that Ben's name is never forgotten. Ben Needham was born in Sheffield, England on the 29th of October 1989 to his parents, Kerry Needham and Simon Ward, and both of them were just teenagers when Ben came along. Kerry was only 17 when Ben came along, but he quickly became her entire life. She was absolutely besotted with him. And Simon was as well. The two of them loved their son so much, even though Kerry and Simon themselves definitely had a bit of a tumultuous relationship. Kerry's parents were Eddie and Christine Needham, and in 1990, they travelled to the island of Kos, which is in Greece. And they absolutely fell in love with this gorgeous little island. And when they came home back to Sheffield, they realised that they were struggling with unemployment, they were living in a bit of poverty, and why shouldn't they just pack their bags and move to Coz? And so that's what they did. In January of 1991, Eddie, Christine, and their two sons, 11-year-old Danny and 17-year-old Stephen, all move over to the Greek island of Coz, and Kerry joins them just a few months later. So Kerry stays in England at first with Simon and Ben, but soon realises that she just wants to be with her family. So just after Easter, Kerry moves out there, and soon after that, Simon comes over to join them. Now Kerry immediately gets a job at a little hotel, and she's really enjoying her life out there just as much as Eddie and Christine are. But Simon is struggling. Simon tries to get a job, he's sort of working as a labourer, but he keeps sort of like losing his jobs. Like, it just doesn't work out for him, he doesn't like it, he feels really lonely. He was only a child at this point, he was 21 years old and he just wanted to be back at home with his family. And so he makes a really, really difficult decision to leave Kerry and Ben in Greece and go back home to Sheffield. Kerry, Simon and Ben were all living in a little apartment together and Simon actually calls home to his family and asks them to wire him some money because he can't afford a flight home himself and he says goodbye to Ben and to Kerry and just a few days before Ben's disappearance, he flies back to England and he says it was one of the hardest decisions he's ever had to make. He just couldn't get a job and he was so, so unhappy. The day Ben disappeared was the 24th of July, 1991, and the day started off just like any other on the island. Kerry had gone to work at a local hotel, and so Christine was looking after Ben. Now Christine, Eddie, and their two boys currently lived in a small caravan on the island because they had a farmhouse which they'd bought, but they were renovating it, and it was gonna take a few months. They couldn't live in it whilst they are renovating. And so they were living in this caravan temporarily. So Christine was at the caravan with 11 year old Danny and 21 month old Ben. Eddie and their 17 year old son Stephen were at the farmhouse working on the renovation. Christine says she'd had a bit of a difficult morning with Ben. I mean, he wasn't doing anything awful. He was just being a toddler, but he was like refusing to eat. He was playing up a little bit. So she decides to put him in the buggy and they were gonna walk up to the farmhouse to see Eddie and Stephen. And that's exactly what they do. Christine gives him a couple of small toys cars, you know, like the, I suppose back in 1991 there would be more like metal toy cars, nowadays it would probably be more plastic, um, but she gives him a couple of these small cars, puts them in the buggy and off they go. The farmhouse was in a pretty remote area, it was kind of on the top of a hill with just one single lane leading up to it, it was like a dirt track and nowadays I think there's quite a few more houses around this area, but at the time this farmhouse was pretty much it. Further down the lane, there was one other house which was in the process of being built, uh, but nobody was living in it yet. So their farmhouse was literally just this lone house on the top of a hill, fields as far as you can see, hills, lots of like bushes and nature around. There was nobody else there, it was literally just this farmland. 
So Christine, Danny and Ben walk up the dirt track to this house. When they get there, Christine lets Ben out the buggy, he's playing with his toy cars, and everyone comes outside to say hi to them. And Christine just lets Ben go off to play. I mean, this was 1991, so it wasn't really the era like it is now of strange danger and kids being abducted. She felt pretty safe just letting him go off to wander. This farmhouse, like I said, was literally in the middle of nowhere. There was nobody walking past that would grab him or anything like that. It was just their little idyllic space. And so Ben just goes off wandering and everyone's having a chat. Christine realises eventually that Ben's wet himself, he wasn't wearing a nappy, so she just takes his shorts off and hangs them up on a tree to dry. And just after lunchtime, probably around like one, half one, the entire family sit down for a traditional Greek lunch and they actually have a friend join them. And this friend is either spoken about as a friend or was apparently the owner of the house they were renovating, even though I'm pretty sure that Christine and Eddie were the owners of the house because they'd bought it to live in. Um, quite confusing, but I suppose it doesn't really matter. Um, so it wasn't just family, they did have a friend with them. Shortly after lunch, Ben's uncle Stephen gets from his motorbike and drives away into the town. He goes down the dirt track. Shortly after this, Christine realises that she hasn't heard from Ben in a little while. He was a standard toddler and he made quite a lot of noise and it was kind of like eerily quiet. And so she goes outside to look for him and she can't find him anywhere. She goes down the front of the house or like walks down the dirt track and Eddie goes out the back of the house to look in all the fields and they just can't find him. Christine actually like wanders right down the track past the house that's being built just off the track and she realizes that like there's no way that Ben could have walked down this far. Like it hadn't been that long since she'd last seen him and so she starts to wander back and assumes that he's just hiding somewhere only Eddie has looked through all of the fields and still can't find him. And of course the two were like a little bit concerned but they weren't freaking out at this point because they just assume that Stephen has taken Ben on his motorbike. Maybe it was a little bit of denial, they didn't want to think they'd lost Ben and so convince themselves that Stephen had taken him with him. Um, but like I said earlier, this was 1991, so the first thing that springs to your head is an abduction. Christine also notices that Ben's shorts are no longer on the tree and his toy cars are nowhere to be seen either, which further leads her to believe that Stephen's taken him with him to put his shorts back on and Ben's taken his toys. I think perhaps if the shorts were still on the tree, then maybe they would have thought something a little bit different but you never know what you're gonna think in a situation like that. Of course, this was a time with no mobile phones, so they couldn't call Stephen to ask him. They just had to kind of like wait until they saw him. Later that evening, around 7.30 p.m., they go around to Kerry's apartment and they find Stephen in the shower. So they sort of shout through the door like, is Ben with you? And Stephen's like, no, I haven't seen him since I left the farmhouse earlier. And this is where they start to freak out. They immediately go to the police who go up to the hillside to start to look for Ben and Christine has the awful job of waiting for Kerry outside work to let her know what had happened. And Christine says that the police want Kerry to go up to the farmhouse immediately to help them search for Ben. If Ben's hiding somewhere, maybe he'll come out at the sound of his mother's voice. Even at this point, abduction hadn't even crossed anyone's mind. It wasn't until around midnight that Eddie finally thinks, like, actually, maybe somebody took him. So Eddie rushes down to the docks. He gets there about 2, 3 a.m. And he is frantically looking for Ben. And he's looking, he has, like, a flashlight on him. And he's looking inside cars as people are leaving. Only you've got this guy who's standing there with the flashlight, staring into people's cars, trying to find a little boy but people don't realize what he's doing so people are just getting really really freaked out with this guy trying to look in everyone's cars and he causes a bit of like not hysteria but people are getting concerned and it's just not working out and the police had actually told eddie that they would meet him down at the dock but nobody ever comes by this point hundreds of cars have already left the island like and eddie is very much aware that ben could be anywhere you see cos is a really really small island and if they couldn't find him on the island it meant that he wasn't there anymore and Eddie was very much aware of this. Now the Greek police don't exactly handle Ben's disappearance in the worst way. They immediately look at the Needhams, which makes sense. In a lot of these cases, the first people you do want to look at is the parents. Only eventually, of course, it turned out that the Needhams didn't have anything to do with it. 
and it just delayed the entire search process. So they're extensively questioning Needhams for days on end, like I think two or three days, they're just questioning them. They particularly look at Stephen, who they thought was their biggest suspect. Stephen's motorbike had a huge dent on it, and so their theory was that Stephen had hit Ben with his motorbike and then driven off with him and buried his body somewhere. Despite Stephen saying like, this isn't true, I didn't do that, I didn't kill my nephew. If I did kill my nephew, then I would have told somebody. Um, and eventually he actually manages to prove that this dent had been there the entire time, months beforehand, and he was eventually let off. The docks and the airports weren't informed about Ben's disappearance for three days. Like, how many people do you think left the island in those three days, through the docks, through the airport? By the time they told the airport, it was way too late. Like, if somebody was going to get Ben off the island, they would have done it in the first few hours, not three days later. The police also looked into the possibility that Simon had returned to the island and abducted Ben and taken him back to the UK. So Simon actually had to return to COS with the paperwork to prove that he had been in the UK the entire time he hadn't flown back to COS. There were a few cultural differences that also held up the investigation in the first few days, differences between the UK and Greece that the police just couldn't really grasp. The first one was that when Kerry was first questioned, they accused her of being a bad mum, she didn't love her son, she must have harmed him. Because she had a job. In Greece, apparently at this time, it was really rare for a mother to leave her children with somebody else and go to work. And Kerry had to explain to them that she worked because she needed money and her mum was looking after Ben, she did love him, she just had to get a job and that's quite a normal thing in the UK but the Greek police just couldn't get their brains around this. It was also confusing to the police that Kerry and Simon had a child together and weren't married, they couldn't wrap their heads around this. And as well as this, Ben's name confused them. Now Ben's full name was Ben Stephen Needham, the middle name after his uncle. But this obviously isn't in line with Greek custom and tradition. You see, often in Greece, young boys take their paternal grandfather's first name as their first name, and they take their father's name as their middle name. And so the Greek police were very confused over the fact that his name was just Ben and his middle name was after his uncle. For a while they were like questioning his paternity, they were very very confused and again Kerry just had to keep explaining like this is just the way it is in the UK, like his name is his name, his father is Simon, I'm his mother, I love him, we had nothing to do with his disappearance. After about three days, the Greek police finally decide that the Needhams are probably innocent and so they move on to other avenues of investigation. And at this point, they themselves start suspecting abduction. On the 25th, so the day after Ben's abduction, the builders who are working on the house just down the lane come forward saying they'd seen a white car parked in the lane and in this white car there were two men sat in the front and one woman in the back. They'd seen the car parked around 2.30, which was actually around the time that Ben had gone missing. They thought it was a white Suzuki Alto or something similar to that. And turns out the police never followed up on this lead. They never looked into it, it just kind of got put on a back burner. Like I said, the police didn't notify the docks or the airport for a few days, a couple of days. Some sources say they were notified on the 26th, some say the 27th, but regardless, it was too late. Once they were notified, one woman actually came forward saying that on the 24th, she'd seen a boy who matched Ben's description, who was speaking in English to an older boy around the age of eight. And the way the boys were speaking, she didn't think they were related. And this boy was very, very similar in looks to Ben. Over the years, there have been many, many sightings reported of Ben, over 300 in Greece alone, lots of these on the island of Kos. But if you ask me, Ben did not stay on that island. The last place I'd be looking for him at this point would be on COS. Somebody would have taken him off the island pretty quickly. And COS is a really popular tourist destination for people from the UK, from all over Europe, who would be bringing their blonde-haired, blue-eyed children. And most of these reported sightings were probably just other tourists. After 11 days, the police chief says, we now believe we have searched every possible part of the area. The boy is not there. It leaves us with a great mystery. We have no theories. We have no solutions. They essentially give up at this point, they have no idea what happened to him, they've searched everywhere they can, and it kind of just leads to a dead end. Not to say that they completely give up on the investigation, because they definitely do continue looking for him, but I think after the first 11 days, they kind of just like have to put their hands up and be like, we don't have a clue what's happened here. The Needham family informed the British Embassy about Ben, but the Embassy couldn't offer any help to the Needhams because nobody had been arrested. And they said that they thought that the Greek police were the best ones to deal with this because they knew the area better than any British person coming over could do. 
In September, with absolutely no leads as to what had happened to Ben, the Needham family have to return back to the UK due to family sickness and they just, they had no choice, they had to go back and they said that it was absolutely heartbreaking having to leave the island where their boy could still be. Kerry moves back in with Simon in Sheffield but she's in a really, really bad way. Her mental health is just all over the place and eventually she actually ends up having a nervous breakdown. Kerry later said at this time that she was hallucinating every day. She could hear Ben calling her from the other room. She would see him running down the hallway. It was a really, really hard time for her. Eventually, she had to go to hospital to take time to get better, whilst Eddie and Christine carried on the search for Ben without her. At this point, the Greek authorities' main line of inquiry was abduction, and they had something very specific in mind. They'd had multiple tips in from people saying that they'd seen young, blonde boys with Romany families. And apparently also on the day that Ben went missing, Eddie was searching for Ben and went down to speak to the builders down the lane. And the builders said this word over and over again, which meant, Romany. Of course, Eddie didn't speak Greek, so he didn't know at the time exactly what they were saying, but as the years have passed, he's come to believe that's exactly what they were saying. Roma people make up a small percentage of the Greek population. There's between 200,000 to 300,000 Roma people living in Greece. But as you can probably guess, there's a lot of racism towards the Roma people, not only in Greece, but pretty much worldwide. Romas originate from North India, so as you can guess, they have dark skin and dark hair, although this isn't a rule. They can be fairer skin, they can have lighter hair. Roma people in Greece have largely maintained their own customs and traditions, although a lot of them have sort of assimilated into regular Greek life. There are Roma communities who have continued with the nomadic lifestyle, sort of moving around the country, living in tents and makeshift buildings. They're actually commonly referred to as Roma camp, but there are also Roma communities who have settled into Greek cities and towns. Roma people in Greece typically suffer with a lot of poverty. There's housing issues, education, medical care, and they just can't get the same amount of care as regular Greek people do. It's a mixture of the way they live their lives and racism and they just generally tend to struggle. Of course, this isn't a rule for every single Roma person in Greece, but generally that's the kind of lifestyle they tend to have. So as the story of Ben's disappearance spread around Greece, people turned to blame the Roma community, their inbuilt racism. People were calling in sightings left, right and centre saying that they'd seen Roma families with young, blonde-haired, blue-eyed boys. And even now, if you Google Ben's name, you will find hundreds of stories from like literally the last couple of years still implicating the Roma people in his disappearance. And I'm not saying there's absolutely no chance that Roma people did have something to do with Ben's disappearance. Of course, they may have done it, but there's no more chance of them doing it than any other type of community. Of course, I'm only scratching the surface here, but there is such a deep inbuilt racism against the Roma people in Greece. And there's a long held stereotype that Roma people steal other children, steal babies. And this is a rumor that goes back hundreds and hundreds of years. And this was further fueled in 2013 when authorities found a blonde haired, blue eyed girl living in a Roma community in Greece. This girl was called Maria and she looked nothing like the people who were claiming to be her parents. Of course, the police do a DNA test and it comes back showing that Maria was absolutely not the daughter of these people. And so it hit the headlines, Romany people kidnapping children. Eventually they managed to chase down the real mother of Maria and it turned out that the mother of Maria was also a Romany. Maria was a Romany child, even though she had blonde hair and blue eyes. The mother had already had two children. She was living in deep poverty in Bulgaria and just couldn't look after a third child. And so she sells the child. Some sources say that she sold the child directly to this couple in Greece. Other sources say that she actually sold Maria to child traffickers who eventually sold Maria to the highest bidders. I'm not 100% sure which one is true there. So Maria hadn't been abducted and she was Romany. I mean, she was sold, so there's still a lot of like ethical moral questions there but she hadn't been abducted. Just days later after the story of Maria came out, Irish authorities actually went to a Roma camp in Ireland and took two children, blonde haired, blue eyed, who they believed had also been sold to them. And they do the DNA tests and it came back that the people who were claiming to be the parents 
were indeed their parents. The point I'm trying to make here is that although Roma people generally have dark hair, dark skin, it is very much possible that they can give birth to blonde-haired, blue-eyed children. Child trafficking and illegal adoption rates in Greece are generally pretty high, like higher than most other countries in Europe. And Greek people love to say that this is the fault of the Roma people, but honestly, the Roma people make up such a small percentage of the Greek population that you can't just put all of the blame on them. Like, of course there are Roma trafficking rings, but there are also just other Greek trafficking rings as well. Kerry said around the time of the discovery of Maria that this case gave her hope. It proved to her that child trafficking rings in Roma communities are a thing and this may be what happened to Ben. This spotlight on the Roma community is further intensified when a man called Aridorus Bedzios comes forward from jail saying that in 1996 he'd gone to a Roma camp in Larissa to search for his own son. He'd basically escaped from jail and was going to look for his son and then ended up getting put back in jail. Um, he comes forward saying that when he was at this camp in Larissa, he saw a young boy who looked exactly like Ben. And Eddie and Christine actually travel over to Greece to speak to this guy in jail. Bezios actually goes to the police and gives them a full statement and Bezios even says that apparently this family told him that they'd got him from Coz. Um, only the police never did anything with this whatsoever. The police never followed up on Bedzios' claim because they said that he was a criminal and he wasn't to be trusted. However, a taxi driver from the same area came forward saying that they'd seen the same family, it was a family called the Karimi family, with the same, we assume, blonde haired, blue eyed boys. And again, the police still didn't follow this up. Eddie and Christine personally followed up multiple sightings over the years. Like they were traveling back and forth from Greece, like pretty much every single month. Every single time they got a tip, they were going over to Greece. They were talking to Roma communities, Greek people, trying to find anything they could. They'd go armed with big pictures of Ben. And of course there was like a language barrier there, so it wouldn't have been easy, but they did everything they could. And when Kerry was out of hospital feeling better, she would join them on their trips as well. Over the years, multiple people have been DNA tested to compare their DNA to that of Ben's. Only of course, nothing has come back as positive. In November, 1998, a blonde boy was seen on the beach and somebody actually went up to him and like tussled his hair to take some like hair DNA from him and they tested it and it was proven that it wasn't Ben. And um, then in 2013, a video of a man actually surfaced, a man from a Roma community who looked very much like Ben may have looked as an adult. And this guy comes forward and like gets his DNA tested and it's proven that he wasn't Ben either. And then that same year, an age progression photo of Ben was released and a man came forward claiming that he thought he looked a lot like Ben and he had no pictures of himself before the age of two, which he found very, very strange. And this was like a huge deal. Loads of people thought that this could be the guy um, only it wasn't, it wasn't Ben. Multiple age progression photos have been released over the years. There was one in 1992, 2000, 2003, 2007, 2013, and the most recent one is 2017. I'm gonna put the most recent one up on the screen now. Kerry has worked so, so hard over the years to ensure that Ben's story is not forgotten, but she's really, really struggled with it. If you compare her struggle to the story of the McCanns, for example, who literally haven't left the media since the day that Maddie disappeared, you really start to feel sorry for her because she has had to fight tooth and nail to get the police to look for Ben, for money towards it, just to keep his name in the headlines. And the McCanns, just seem to have it come easy to them. Kerry says that she thinks it's an issue of social class. She's from Sheffield, she's not that well off, whereas the McCanns are doctors, they have the money to be able to push it forward themselves. I'm not gonna go into it too much because I did raise a question of like social class with the McCanns in I think it was my Shannon Matthews video. So if you're interested in that, you can go over and watch that. But Kerry has really had to fight for this. In 1994, Kerry and Simon actually had another child. This time they had a daughter who they named Liana. And now Liana was the spitting image of Ben in every way. Both of them very much looked like their mother. Blonde haired, blue eyed, really delicate features. And when you Google Ben's case, Liana's name is probably the name that comes up most frequently next to that of Kerry's because Liana has dedicated her entire life to finding her old brother, the brother that she never met. Because they looked so, so similar, when Liana was just 22 months old, she was used in a reconstruction to sort of like trace Ben's last movements. And Liana says this is actually her earliest memory. And you would think that maybe she'd start to resent like spending her entire life looking for a brother that she never met. 
but you can tell when you read interviews with her like she feels so passionately about it because she's missing a part of her life just as much as Kerry is even though she never met him. In October 2012 officers from the South Yorkshire Police actually travelled to COS with a group of specialist searchers to conduct a search on a pile of rubble that was near the farmhouse and they're pretty sure that this pile of rubble was not there when Ben went missing. It's basically just like building rubble but grass had like grown over it. They believed that Ben may be buried under it. You see recently they'd started to look into a line of inquiry that Ben had been accidentally buried by excavators. So they go here armed with plenty of searchers, geographical survey equipment, forensic archaeologists and human remains detection dogs but of course they find no trace of Ben. In February of 2015 the British police were granted £700,000 to help in the search for Ben and Kerry really had to fight tooth and nails for this like she was begging the government for a really long time like please just give me more money to look for my son and again you compare it to the McCann's who constantly have money thrown at them in the search for Madeline Kerry really had to fight for this like she got lawyers and everything. Around the same time a TV appeal about Ben was aired in Greece and it was actually viewed by over 60% of the population but again nothing of any help came in. Now in 2016 a brand new line of inquiry opens up. A man called Konstantinos Barkas who was also known as Dino dies of stomach cancer. Now Konstantinos was one of the builders who was working on the farmhouse just down the lane that day and apparently he made a deathbed confession. In 2015 as he was dying of cancer he tells a friend that that day he'd hit Ben with his digger and then had buried him. Now Constantinos's family have completely denied this saying like they have no idea why he would just tell his friend this and not tell them and that they just don't think this is true. He just never mentioned anything about it and his family find it really really hard to believe. And Kerry says this was a complete shock to her because she'd always had this just mother's intuition that Ben was still alive out there somewhere. She'd never really thought about the fact that Ben could be dead. She was so convinced that he'd been abducted that he was probably still alive. And now everyone was telling her that he was probably dead and buried. On the 16th of September 2016, the police start a brand new search for Ben's remains. And again, they search around the farmhouse, but they focus on a completely different area to where the rubble was that they'd searched in 2012. The search focused mainly on a tree that they're pretty sure had only grown since Ben disappeared, so it wasn't there in 1991. They're not just looking for Ben, they're looking for literally any clue, anything that belonged to Ben. So a 19-strong team of South Yorkshire police officers, forensic specialists and archaeologists go over to COS and they conduct this search. And the search lasted one month that actually ended on the 16th of October 2016. During the search they find over 100 bones, each of which was tested only to be found to be an animal bone. And they also find a small piece of leather which they think belonged to the sandal that Ben was wearing that day. Alongside this they find a small toy car, a car which Carrie says she's 99.9% .9 sure was Ben's and on both of these items they find traces of blood. And this has been a really, really long process to get this blood tested. Eventually, a company, a private company in America contacted Kerry and said they were willing to test this for free. And she sent it off and actually, literally came out in the news last week. This is what I read on the day that I was searching about Ben's case. And it came back that the blood on both the sandal and the toy car wasn't Ben's. This is basically taking the case back to square one again because people were so convinced when they found this small leather strap and they found the toy car, this was 100% proof that Ben was there somewhere, that he'd been accidentally buried. But now it's been proven that the blood didn't belong to him. People don't really know what to think. I remember when this search was conducted two years ago, I was following it in the news and everyone was so convinced that they were going to find Ben there and it was a bit of a shock to the system for everyone when they didn't find him. So now it's 27 years later, Ben would be 29 years old and he may still be alive and he may have no idea who he really is. So just to round up here, we have the two prevailing theories. The first one is that Ben was abducted either by Romani people or otherwise. The general consensus is that if he was abducted, he would have been sold into a child trafficking ring and possibly sold to a family raised and still be alive today having no idea who he was all of those years ago. There's also a theory I haven't touched on and that possibly he was abducted, abused and then murdered shortly after. There is a possibility that he is dead and buried somewhere on the island, just not near the farmhouse. In all honesty, child trafficking is something that comes up a lot in different child disappearance cases and I'm never really one to believe it. 
There's something about this case, about Ben, which makes me believe that maybe he is still alive somewhere and was raised by a loving family, but possibly they just bought him, maybe they couldn't have kids themselves, maybe they thought they were doing a good thing by taking in this child, and maybe he is still alive out there. I don't know, there's just something about this which gives me that tiny glimmer of hope. Kerry says that she hopes this is what happened. She says if she does find Ben one day and he was happy and raised by a loving family, she doesn't want to take him away from that family. She just wants to know that he's safe and loved and alive. The other theory, of course, that Ben did die by the farmhouse that day, possibly knocked down by a digger and buried somewhere in the area. Although, of course, his body hasn't been found and they have searched. Or another theory that nobody else was involved, possibly Ben wandered off that day and got himself into an accident, maybe fell down a ditch and hurt himself and couldn't get back out and they just never happened to find him. Of course, you have got to wonder why he didn't call out, why Eddie or Christine didn't hear him. But it is a possibility, it's a very rough area with lots of like bush, lots of dips in the grass, lots of like wide open fields. It could have happened. Though Eddie did say that if this was the case then vultures would have been circling the area, they would have sensed there was a dead body there. And Eddie said that he never saw any vultures in the area. Or of course it could go the other way, maybe vultures did get him and that's why there's never been any trace of his body. There are a thousand other theories I could talk about in this case, but I think I'm going to leave it there and leave it down to you guys in the comments to let me know what you think happened to Ben. This is a really important case to keep talking about because there is a chance that Ben may still be alive. So if we keep his name out there, keep his face in the papers on the internet, maybe one day Kerry will get lucky and somebody will come forward and finally that DNA test might come back as positive. As always, leave your requests for other videos down below. Give this video a thumbs up if you liked it and subscribe to my channel for more. And I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.